thank you. Wow. What a blessing. Praise be to God. Our God can do exceedingly, abundantly, Derek, above all we can ask or imagine. Imagine. Can I give a testimony real quick before we get into the word on that from this week? I was in, uh, I've been a pastor since college, which was five years ago. <laughs> and uh, I was in denominational service overseeing seven states and helping pastors and missionaries and churches and so forth. And then about a year and a half ago, the Holy Spirit spoke to myself and my wife, Colleen. Pray for her. She's not here today because she's sick. She got shingles in November for the second time in her life, and her immune system is really messed up. And so please put her on your uh, prayer list. She's, she's struggling physically. And, uh, she, but God laid it on our hearts to step out of the boat, to say, okay, it's time for something fresh in your life. It, it, it's time for you to go back and be humble and start over and go in new places with me. So I resigned at the end of my four-year term, and it was like, well, what are you going to do when your resume, you're 50-some years old, and your resume says church, 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 you know? Uh, Western Union isn't going to hire you, you know? And, uh, but the Lord opened doors, won't go into that and so forth. Just want to give this testimony. I had a business meeting on Friday with my two business partners at Presbyterian St. Luke's Hospital downtown, met with two of their VPs. What our thought and our business plan was, it was if they would just say we got a second meeting, that was a home run for us. And so we went into that meeting thinking, and it's a relocation. We would help them with uh, relocating executives, surgeons, etc., these kinds of things. And, uh, and about 15 minutes into the meeting, they interrupted us and they said, we need you guys, but instead of just doing it with our hospital, we need you to do it with the division, all of our hospitals. <laughs> yeah. So our second meeting needs to be with the VPs on the division level. And so that night, I went to bed thanking God for what he was doing. And then I woke up in the middle of the night, and all of a sudden it was like, okay, we thought if we would do 10 deals with them this year that that would be a home run. And they were saying that there's potentially 1,400. <laughs> and they didn't ask for my resume. Thank God. <laughs> so I guess they were assuming we knew what we were doing. But it was God's, God's goodness. But here's the other thing on that. The guy that's coaching us was a senior VP for Grable Relocation. And he's retired now. We got to know him through a friend. And uh, his, his uh, accounts that he was overseeing were Oracle, eBay, Microsoft, uh, the big dogs like that. Amazon was another one that he had. And he's been preparing us. Get this. He gets paid probably hundreds of thousands of dollars to uh, consult with companies. He came to us and he said, I like you guys. It's fun working with you. This year I want to help you for $600. <laughs> so, so our God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask or imagine. And it isn't because we earn it. It's because of his goodness. It's because of his goodness. So, uh, last night my son and his wife, they decided they needed to get out of town for Valentine's Day, so they dropped their dog off to stay with us. It's a little miniature schnauzer, and he's adopted me. My wife was sick, and so I'm in another room, sleeping in another bed, so I don't get sick. So I can be here, and that dog's sleeping with me, which has never happened in my life. But anyway, he was there. But that's why, why I bring him up is, is when Baxter, the little miniature schnauzer, gets excited. Have you ever seen a little dog when they get excited and they just start running back and forth, running back and forth, you know? During worship, I just wanted to start running, man. Woo! Let me tell you. Ha, <laughs> 
Uh, you're going to have to invite your friends to church and say, you got to get to RCF because this old white guy pulled a hamstring trying to run like his dog. This morning, I'd prepared. I'm catching my breath. I did one lap too many. Uh, but let's go. May have snow at the top, but there's still fire in the belly. <laughs> I was driving over, and God has a sense of humor, but I don't think he's always funny. Do you ever... You understand where it's like, okay, God, do you think that's funny? I don't think that's funny. Because I prepared a message, prayed about it. I was so excited about it from Daniel chapter 3 on the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace entitled The Fellowship of the Fire. I was really excited about it. I'm driving over here, and all of a sudden begin to sense the Holy Spirit saying, I don't want you to do that. I want you to do this. And it's like, uh, no, God. Because I have too much respect for Pastor Felix and this church, love for this church. I'd like to be prepared. And uh, so we're going in a different direction this morning. I want to talk to you about identity. Identity. So before we talk about it, I just want to lead in a simple prayer. If you agree with this prayer, just pray it in your heart with me. Abba, Father... I am listening. Speak words of life to me. And then if you're in agreement, pray this for the people next to you. Abba, Father, would you speak to the person on my left, the person on my right, and especially the people here who came and they're hanging on by a string, a thread. Would you speak to us words from heaven? And Lord... Uh, Pastor Dennis is just the glove. You're the hand. Fill him and use him for your glory, for the blessing of this church, and the blessing that they are to their families and their work this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's just do a Bible study, and then I, I have a couple of stories that I think I'm supposed to share. Talking about identity. So let's start at the beginning, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Doesn't tell us how he did it. Didn't tell us how long it took him to do it. It just said that he did it. And in Hebrews, it says that he created everything out of nothing, which is, physicists call that a singularity. It's consistent with what we know scientifically about creation. And then go down to verse 27, let's go to 26, then God said, Elohim said, let us, us, can you say that? Us. Something's going on behind the scenes right here in the first chapter of the Bible where there's this one God, but he's speaking in the plural, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image, image, say that word to a neighbor, image. In our likeness, let them rule over creation. Verse 27, so God created man. What it's speaking about there is humanity. So God created man in his own, say the word again, image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. There's a lot of theology there. The male and female, that's for a different day. But just notice that, that, that it's a reflection of God is not just in man or just in woman, but it's together. And that if you dig down into the Hebrew here, when it's speaking about that you've made me a helper, it's, speak, it's a word, a complex word in the Hebrew that says she is like me, but she's also delightfully not like me. She's a human being like me. We both have a brain. We both have a body. 
But our bodies are different, our psychology is different, and praise God for that difference. But we're made in His image. So, the place we need to begin understanding our identity is that we are made in the image of God. Every human being is a reflection of the image of God. Okay, let's move on then to chapter 3. There's the fall of man, the serpent, in, uh, verse 1, was more crafty than all the other wild animals. And so he tempts the woman, she takes the fruit that was forbidden, and then she gives it to her husband. He eats it. Verse 7, their eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man, verse 8, and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. My theology is that that's Jesus because he's in a body. He's walking in the cool. So that's called a Christophany is the word they use at Denver Seminary for that. The Lord God, he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And so that's the first manifestation that something's wrong, that we have a tendency that when God is seeking us out, we have a tendency of hiding. But the Lord called out to man, where are you? God knew where he was. But God wants relationship. And so he speaks to us on our level, just like I have a little granddaughter and I speak to her on her level. Not to be patronizing, but I want her to understand and to grow. And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. That's part of our identity. Is that we inherited a sin nature... And because of that sin nature, we hide from God. Because of that sin nature, we're ashamed that if people would see us and who we are, naked, so to speak. I'm not talking about physically, although he was speaking about physically. I'm talking about emotionally in who we are, what we really think, and so forth. If we say, boy, so we need to hide that. Shame is part of the human condition. Verse 11, and he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman you put here with me. <laughs> I don't need to explain that because all the women understand right there. There's some men going, huh? And just ask your wife after church. She'll explain it. But what it is is this. That's part of our identity also. There's shame. You see, there's a big difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is, I did something wrong. Shame is, I am wrong. That if I am actually myself, God will reject me and you'll reject me. That's shame. The other side of shame then is blame. So he goes, well, I hid from you. Why? Why? Because I was ashamed I was naked. Why this happened? The woman that you gave me. So he's blaming not only his wife, he's blaming God. And he's abdicating leadership. Have you ever worked for a boss that when something went wrong, they blame you when it's them? Huh? That's really bad leadership, isn't it? But it's our identity. It's our identity. I have a pastor friend, very, very good pastor. And he grew up without a dad. And uh, he would ask his mom about his dad, and she would always kind of change the subject and so forth. And as he got older, that got more and more frustrating, got out of high school, went into college. And really, his relationship with his, his mom was, was pretty much non-existent because... She wouldn't talk to him about that. Finally, she sat down with him. And when she was 18 years old, she was abducted, she was raped, she was beaten, she was in the hospital for three weeks, and she became pregnant, became pregnant with my friend. 
And I heard him tell this story in the midst of a message. And the core of his message was this. What uh, Satan intended for harm, God intended for good. Okay? But this is part of our identity. Our identity is not just Genesis chapter 1. It's also Genesis chapter 3. And then it gets worse. Look at Genesis chapter 4. Verse 1, Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And so then later she gave birth to his brother Abel. And uh, Cain and Abel, you know the story. Verse 6, the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. See, and that's the tension you and I feel in our identity, in the, in the deepness of our soul. That's the tension that you and I feel is the tension between Genesis 1, a made in God's image. God doesn't make junk. I'm just a little lower than the angels and crowned with glory and honor. But in my heart, I have killed my brother with enmity. That tension, that struggle. Look over Psalm chapter 36. Let's just take that tension a little further. Psalm 36, an oracle is within my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before his eyes. For in his own eyes he flatters himself Too much to detect or hate his sin. The words of his mouth are wicked and deceitful. He has ceased to be wise and do good. Even on his bed he plots evil. He commits himself to a sinful course and does not reject what is wrong. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 4. Am I my brother's keeper? I don't think so, God. Then it pivots. The very next verse, verse 5. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice like the great deep. O Lord, you preserve both man and animal. How priceless is your unfailing love. Genesis chapter 1. So the question is, if we're made in God's image, then who is God? Look over at Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. It's Moses. He's saying, hey, if you don't go with us, God, I'm, I, I resign. I'm not leading this, these people, your people, these stiff-necked people. It's not worth it. There's not enough money in Egypt for me to do this. If you don't go with us, I'm out of here. Show me your glory. And then God, this is the first time in the Bible that God describes himself. Why it's pertinent to what we're talking about right now is if we're made in God's image, then what is God's image? You see, physically do we reflect God? He doesn't have a body, Jesus does, but do we all look exactly like Jesus? No, that's that's a genetic impossibility to be able to do that. And so there has to be something deeper Not that our bodies don't matter, they matter quite a bit. And God knit you together in your mother's womb, and again, he makes no junk. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But here's how God describes himself, and so this is the image that he wants us to partake in, is this. Verse 6, he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And so that's the image that God wants us to have, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. Okay, let's bring this together. So do you sense the tension that we have? Can you understand why counseling and, and uh, psychotropic drugs and uh, medicating ourselves are, 
our multi-billion dollar industries, it's because we have this tension inside of us. And we go, are we? You know, so some people say it's like you have two dogs inside you, and which dog do you feed, right? That may describe the reality, but it doesn't describe the antidote. So turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Let me tell you a little bit about Hebrew grammar. In Hebrew grammar, they don't have superlatives like good, better, best. And so what they would do in in the Hebrew for superlatives is they would repeat it up to three times for the greatest emphasis. Greatest would be, so that's why it says in, in Isaiah 6, it says, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. It's saying he is the holiest. He is in a category all by himself. Here's the point. Jesus understood that. His Jewish listeners understood that. This is the only place in the Gospels where Jesus tells three stories. Holy, holy, holy. So he's just putting a neon sign on this saying, guys, pay attention to this. To understand me. To understand how your identity can be recreated. It's three stories emphasizing this is so important with one point. The first story, as you see, is the parable of the lost sheep. Now notice, this is very important, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around him to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So you've got to understand what his audience is to understand what his point is. Can I just stop there for a second and just tell part of my story? And that is, I was in denominational service. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a very noble thing to do. So I'm not speaking anything negatively about that. It's about me, okay? It's not about a denomination or anything like that. It's about me. Uh, but in the eight years that I did that, it wasn't good for my soul, And I came to the painful realization that maybe I was a Pharisee. So he wrote this for people like me. So the first parable is the parable of lost sheep. Hundred sheep, counts them at that night, one is gone leaves the 99 in the pen and goes out to look for the one and then lays it on his shoulders. (laughs) And he goes back and he goes, let's rejoice because that which is lost has been found. Story number one. Story number two, the parable of the lost coin. There's a widow. She has 10 coins. That's all she has. She loses one. You know, if you have a million dollars, you lose 100000 That hurts, but you still have $900,000. But if you're a widow and you have 10 coins, that's all you have for the month or the year, whatever it is, and you lose one of those, it hurts bad, right? And so she sweeps her house, she finds it, and then she calls together her friends and neighbors. Verse 9, rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. In the same way, Jesus said, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then he gets into the parable of the lost son, where he begins to drill down. He's made the point that that which is lost is very valuable to God and needs to be found. And he's saying, I came to do that. I came to seek and save lost people. I'm a friend to sinners. So Pharisees... Listen to me here. This is really important. So there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate, which would have been one-third of his estate. The only time that a father would give his estate to his children would be on his death. So the son had the guts to say, Dad, I wish you were dead. I want to cash out. So the father gave him one-third of his estate he gave to the young man. And he went off to another land for riotous living. And uh, then he squandered his wealth, verse 13. 
He spent everything. There was a severe famine. Verse 14, he hired himself out to a farm, and he had to feed pigs, which for a Jew was unclean work, and he was starving to death. He comes to his senses in verse 17 and says, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father, and I'll say to him, he's rehearsing, he's rehearsing his speech, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. What is a word that describes what he just said? Shame. Shame. I'm ashamed of myself. I don't deserve to be your son. I am such a bad human being. Look at verse 20, though. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion. Compassion, no judgment. Compassion. He ran to his son, which elderly men would not do that in that day and age, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son begins his speech. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, the dad didn't even listen to the speech at all. He said, bring, bring the best robe. Say best robe. Best robe. best robe. best robe. And put it on him. Put a ring. Say ring. ring. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his fing- feet. Bring the fatted calf and let's kill it. Let's feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to party. Yeah, yeah. They began to celebrate. Meanwhile, verse 25, here we're getting to the, to the turn and the, and the meaning of this, of this story, what it has to say about our identity. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. Steve Lawrence was leading the house right there. They were having a blast. They were eating steaks right there, the fatted calf, man, which that didn't happen very often in their, in their culture that day. So they're having fun. So the older son, he's been working out in the field. He called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come back, he replied. And your father has killed the fatted calf, man. And, and because he has brought him back safe and sound, the older brother became angry and refused to come in. So his father had to leave the party and go outside and had to beg him. But he answered, look, all these years, I've been slaving for you. Slaving for you. What an interpretation he had to work for his dad that he called it slavery. When he was older, so he got two-thirds of the estate. His brother got one-third, he got two-thirds. Slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, who told him that? Huh? Who told him that? Hmm? Whether it's true or not, it's still slander. You killed the fatted calf. Okay, verse 31, okay. Let me stop before I get to verse 31. Remind me to go back to it. Um, The older brother felt that he was slaving for the father. In the last few years of my denominational service, I felt like I was slaving for God. I, I didn't enjoy it. So you say to God, I say to God, all these years I've been slaving for you. And how does God respond? Verse 31. My son. First of all, my son. The father said, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. 
You go to a meeting thinking you're going to get 10 deals and you might get 1,400 deals. All that I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Who was Jesus speaking to? There were sinners around him, but the Pharisees came. The stories for the Pharisees. And saying, will you get excited about your brother, your sister, your uncle, your aunt, who have been snakes, and they've stabbed you in the back, and they are evil, bad people. If there's a, a hell then in our hearts, we think they need to go there. And God is saying, everything I have is yours. You're always with me. I love you with all my heart, but I love them. And I want them to come. And I want them to be changed. Okay, last scripture, because I'm sure I'm running out of time. But First Peter chapter 2. And this is where we bring it all together. Is this okay? Okay. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. We're talking about identity. Genesis 1, our identity made in the image of God. Genesis chapter 3, chapter 4, we have a sin nature. And death has come into our lives and we're enslaved to sin. And then into this, there's Jesus that says there's a way in which a sinner can still be a son. In verse 9 here, 1 Peter chapter 2, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So friends, as followers of Jesus, we go, I'm made in the image of God. And part of that application is I must love my neighbor as myself no matter who they are because they're also made in the image of God. But we have a sin nature. But because of Jesus Christ, we don't have to be a slave to that. It's still there. We're not perfect, but we're under the blood of Jesus. I'm that prodigal that came back. I'm that judgmental Pharisee. And God said, listen, you're my son, and I love you. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. There's a picture that I I brought. There it is right there. This is my granddaughter. I only have one grandchild so far, and uh, her name is Shiloh, but I call her Peach. And we're buddies, as you can see. What you can't see in that picture is, is the, the book that I'm reading to her is the book, Good, Good Father. <laughs> Coley and I were at a concert up at Red Rocks Amphitheater, and the man, young man from Atlanta who wrote that, that chorus, Good, Good Father, was there. And he sang it, and he told us the story. He was in a small group, and there was a young lady in the small group. She was very broken had looked for love in all the wrong places and she was weeping one night and grieving the pain that she never knew her father and because of that father hole in her heart wanting male affection just went down all these roads that just led to brokenness and in her life and the Holy Spirit came and this young man just went over to her and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit began to say he's a good good father he's a good good father he is your father and he is a good father and you are loved by him you are loved by him that's who you are that's who you are and I'm just here to say this morning would you stand with me That's who you are. That's who you are. God knows you by name. And he cares for you. And he's got a great plan for you. 
and he wants to fill you with his love day by day because he's a good, good father. That's who he is. God bless you.